So now that we know what needs to happen in order to form an enolate, uh, we want to talk about specifically what base are we going to choose in order to deprotonate a carbonyl to form an enolate. And here we need to consider the various acidities um, of the things that we're going to be dealing with. So, for example, the pK of ethanol is approximately 16. That of a, an aldehyde, and again, we're just speaking in very uh, general terms here, acid aldehyde is going to be 17. Um, we just talked about acetone, and that's going to be approximately 20, maybe 19 to 20. Um, an ester like ethyl acetate is going to be about 25. And then if we go up to an amide, we're going to be in the range of about 30, okay? So these are all just general numbers um, and you don't have to remember them, but, um, but there's an important point that we need to, to talk about, which is that um, if you're going to form an enolate, um, you really want to form it. You don't want to screw around, right? And so remember that uh, proton transfer is, is basically these pK numbers are equilibrium values. Okay, and they reflect the various stabilities of the two different acids, right? So uh, acid one being deprotonated by a base to give the conjugate acid and conjugate base. Okay, so pKa's uh, reflect that uh, equilibrium value. So what we want to do if we're going to deprotonate a specific carbonyl compound is to pick a base that's strong enough. We have to have a base that's strong enough to deprotonate the thing and not just sort of sort of protonated and set up an equilibrium. For the most part, we want to pull away the proton and let that be the end of it, okay? So practically speaking, what that means is we're usually going to want um, a base that's many orders of magnitude um, stronger uh, than the conjugate base of the thing we're trying to deprotonate, okay? Um, and let, let me just make this more concrete and, and show you um, an example of, of what would be an inappropriate thing to do, okay? So imagine if we wanted to generate the enolate of acetone, okay? And we thought, okay, well, let's, let's try sodium ethoxide, okay? Sodium ethoxide. Well, it is a base, and this, this can uh, serve as an acid. So there would be an equilibrium of proton transfer, right? So to some extent, we would form the sodium enolate of acetone and we would form ethanol okay we would we would do that but just by looking at the pkas of ethanol versus acetone we would expect that there would be 99.9 percent .9 acetone and only about 0.1 mole percent of the uh of the enolate from this mixture now maybe this would be good enough but really probably not Okay, what we're gonna wanna do is to pick a much stronger base so that we can completely remove the proton from acetone and get 100% uh, essentially of that enolate form, okay? So we wanna pick a much stronger base usually than the carbonyl that we're, that we're trying to form here, okay? So what are we going to do? Well, one of the most powerful forms, uh, the, the most powerful bases um, that we have available to us is something called LDA. Okay, this stands for lithium diisopropyl amide. Okay, and so basically all we're doing here is we have diisopropyl amine. Okay, so just an amine with two isopropyl groups on it and we need to pull off that proton to generate our base. So we treat this with butyl lithium, which, so this is a carbon anion. It's more basic than the conjugate base of the amine. So that, that allows us to pull off that proton and we get to this base. So that's a N minus, and then the counter ion is going to be the lithium plus, okay? And this then is LDA, okay? Well, this is a useful base for many reasons. So the pKa here is about 40, right? So that's, that's now we're talking, right? So that's gonna be strong enough to deprotonate um, basically any carbonyl that we want, whether it be the 
um, the ketones, the esters, or even, you know, even really the amides um, could be subject to this uh, strength of base. Okay, so that's good. Uh, so it's strong enough, right? Everyone wants something to be strong enough. Okay, uh, it's because of these isopropyl groups, it's, it's soluble in organic solvents, so that's good. There are other other strong bases that are inorganic, um, but they're, then they're not going to be soluble, and that's a bit of a problem. Um, these isopropyl groups also make it hindered, right? So there's a bit of a problem you can imagine if, if we have this N minus. It can act as a base, but it can also act as a nucleophile, and that can cause certain problems. Um, the isopropyl groups, for the most part, make it so it's not, um, it doesn't act as a nucleophile. So you can react LDA with an ester, and for the most part, you won't expect to get the amide out. So that's a good bit of selectivity. Um, it tends to work at low temperatures. And this is something that's useful for, for selectivity reasons. Okay, so it works at, at low temperatures like minus 78, which is the um, freezing point um, of uh, carbon dioxide. So dry ice uh, baths work well here. Um, and, uh, and so LDA is a, is a very, very useful reagent, and it's one of the most common, very strong bases available to organic chemists. So I just want to show you an example of the use of LDA to generate an enolate. So we could take something like cyclohexanone, we could treat this with LDA, and th THF is the typical solvent, minus 78 degrees. This keeps everything from, from doing naughty side reactions. And if we do that, we get to uh, our lithium enolate, okay? Um, and that's going to then allow us to, to react this as if this is the, you know, this is the, uh, the uh, anionic form of the enolate, um, which then is, is really, really fantastic. So we'll be using uh, LDA as a base for a number of different uh, reactions, particularly when we're just dealing with ketones or uh, unfunctionalized esters. Now, there is a class of carbonyls that we're going to spend a good bit of time talking about where we don't need LDA, where we can actually get away with something uh, much weaker. And so this is going to be um, carbonyls, uh, sorry, not carbonyls, um, uh, so CH bonds that are flanked by two carbonyls or other electron withdrawing groups uh, would suffice too, right? So imagine here if we had this compound, right? So think about these protons here. You deprotonate here, you form an enolate in one direction, but there's the potential to form it in the other direction as well. Right. You can imagine that you basically get twice the stabilization for that anion and the pKa of this position is now all the way down at 9. Okay, So that's, that's pretty acidic. We can also have alternatives to this, and but they basically act the same. Right. So here's one where we've got a ketone on one side and an ester on the other and the acidity of this is about 11 um, and of course we could have two esters and that would work pretty well too. This is a pKa of about 13, okay? So with these types of pKa's, that means that uh, the, um, you know, the, the anion of something like ethanol, which remember is a, is a pKa of 16, that conjugate base, so sodium ethoxide, is going to be strong enough to deprotonate these, um, not completely because there's still gonna be some equilibrium, um, but to do it to the extent that there's, it's basically going to be stoichiometric as far as we can see. So more than a thousand to one or a thousand to one in this case and more than a thousand to one in that case. So stoichiometric for all intents and purposes. Okay. So these are what are known as one, three dicarbonyl compounds or one, three dicarbonyls. Um, they're very much more acidic and we can deprotonate them very easily and do, do enolate type of chemistry. So we'll be talking about both of these bases as we move in on next to talking about actual enolate reactions.